So hello everybody and welcome to this session about excellence in the research system. It's great you've been able to join us. Um, thanks very much for coming along to this session and thanks to our panelists also for agreeing to take part. I'm Stephen Pinfield. I'm Professor of Information Services Management at the University of Sheffield in the UK, and I'm an Associate Director of the Research on Research Institute, which is one of the co-sponsors of the conference. And I'd like to give you a very warm welcome uh, to this session. We do want this session to be genuinely discursive. So although there will be some introductions to the topics from panel members, giving us their perspective on the notion of excellence, in the research system. We do also want to hear from you. Now you can do that in a number of ways. Please do contribute to the chat right from the get-go if possible, please. So we've got some things coming in that we can address and we'll be adding those into the, the discussion. Also, please, if you have a question that you'd like to be uh, addressed by the panel, um, please put it into the Q&A and we'll keep an eye on that as well. Um, during the second part of this session, and we've got an hour and a half for this session, during the second part, we are also hoping to invite members of the audience to switch on their cameras and mics if you're able to, and to participate in that way by asking questions or making comments. So very much encourage you to do that, um, and, and we'll see how, how things go. So thank you very much for, for joining us. We are talking about excellence in the research ecosystem. And this is a topic which has become uh, uh, an, a, a one of uh, increasing debate uh, and discussion. We know that excellence is becoming more and more embedded into the research ecosystem through uh, research evaluation systems, through um, grant application systems, and various different other ways in which excellence is uh, now really central uh, to many decision-making processes uh, in the research system, not least in publication, uh, for example. And yet at the same time, we know that it's uh, controversial, it's contested. A number of people have critiqued the excellence uh, regime, as it were, uh, for creating all sorts of negative consequences. And so what we'd like to do today is to sketch out some responses to this discussion on excellence, to think about uh, some of the ways in which the excellence agenda impacts on the research system, and also to go, to go on to discuss possible alternatives. Now, this is a real challenge because although the excellence uh, notion and the excellence regi regime have been critiqued, Little has emerged in terms of definite proposals about how it can be replaced. And so what we want to do is not just deconstruct, but also think about constructing as well, what might go in its place. And so I'll be interested to hear from panel members uh, about that. So let me welcome our, our panel. Um, first of all, Lisette Young, who's a researcher at uh, CWTS Leiden University and is, is currently on a project uh, as part of the Research on Research Institute. Um, Laura Ravelli, uh, who's coordinator of the Latin American Forum for Research Assessment, FOLEC, at the Latin American Council of Social Sciences. We're still waiting for Laura to, to join us. Um, so I may have to tweak the uh, running order of speakers, but we'll see how we go. Um, then welcome to Cameron Nalem who's Professor of Research Communications at Curtin University. And finally, Zena Sharman, who's Director of Strategy at the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research. All of you are very welcome. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. And we're looking forward to the discussion. This is uh, a note about how we expect uh, things to go. So after this brief introduction, I'm gonna hand over to each of the panel members to talk for about five to 10 minutes uh, to introduce their idea their ideas on, on excellence. And after each uh, panel member's contribution, there will be some time for Q&A on specific issues that they have raised. Then after we've heard from all of them, I'm hoping to engage in a uh, panel-wide discussion on the issues that have come up. And that's where we're really hoping to engage with your questions. And also, though, as I say, there will be opportunity for you to contribute as well. So please do, do bear that in mind. Keep your comments coming in on the chat and do ask questions using the Q&A function 
as well. So that's the agenda for today. And I'm very, look, very much looking forward to hearing both from our panel members and from you, the audience as well. So with that as an introduction, let me hand straight over to Lizette, who's going to be our first speaker. I'll stop sharing. Lizette, you've got some slides you want to share, haven't you? I do, I will share my screen. Okay, brilliant. Over to you, thanks very much. Back to the beginning. Oh. Hmm. It was working just now. It now seems to be a bit stuck. Well, this also works. Okay. Um, thanks, Stephen. Thanks for the introduction uh, already. Um, so yeah, today I'll be talking to you about the Transforming Excellence Project, which is part of the Research and Research Institute. And the other members of the Excellence Project team are uh, Stephen Spinfield, who uh, just introduced you, and, and this, this little cat here. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Stephen moderating our current session and, and also Thomas Franzer, who is uh, not here, but uh, whose input has also been very valuable to the project. Um, so the background to the Excellence Project is the observation that the notion of excellence has become an increasingly important part of the research ecosystem over the last 20 years or so. And the term excellence has become widespread in science policy. Um, research funding and evaluation activities, um, excellence initiatives are generally associated with competitive programs and concentration of funding on what are supposedly the best of the best. But what excellence means often, uh, yeah, remains rather ambiguous. Um, so to get a better grasp of what notions of excellence are doing in the research ecosystem, in the excellence project, we set out to explore different uses of notions of excellence as these appear in research funding organizations. Um, and we specifically look into the concerns and tensions that rise around these different uses and the strategies to mitigate them. Um, so as part of the study, we conducted a literature review that um, is now available as a working paper through the Rory website. And I'll post a link to that one in the chat later. Um, but the core of the project is actually an empirical qualitative study in which eight of the Rory partner organizations kindly agreed to uh, participate. Um, so together with uh, our key contacts at the participating organizations, we, uh, we developed a case study protocol to guide the data collection process at each site. And we asked participants to submit what we called uh, instances of excellence. Um, that they identified within their organizations. And this data collection exercise resulted in a wide range of resources. Uh, amongst the materials are publicly available documents such as strategic plans, mission statements, program guidelines. Uh, but also we got some internal documentation that reflects uh, work in progress, for example, on the development of new conceptual frameworks, strategies and uh, criteria. Um, and in addition to this document analysis, we also conducted two interviews uh, for case study site and we did an online consultation with representatives from the partner organizations to collectively discuss our uh, prelimin preliminary findings. Uh, now, the next slide kind of summarizes some of those uh, preliminary findings. And one of the things I want to emphasize is that despite being heavily critiqued, notions of excellence also come with uh, affordances as in uh, they make certain things possible. Um, so notions of excellence give, for example, shape uh, to a range of activities around funding decisions listed in the blue square, like ranking, comparing, guiding, framing, valuing, and selecting. Um, and in the submitted materials, we also identified different ways in which the term excellence is actually used. Uh, and we roughly categorize these different uses that we encountered as being rather descriptive, aspirational, or objectivist. But we focus our analysis mostly around problems or matters of concern associated with excellence. And um, this list that you see in the slide is uh, definitely uh, not exhaustive, and I don't have time to elaborate on all the points mentioned on this slide. Um, but in a bit, I'm going to zoom in on the matter of equity, diversity, and inclusion, also to highlight one of our observations, namely that the notion of excellence can be considered a particularly sticky concept, so to speak. Um, and this idea of uh, sticky technologies 
uh, has kind of been conceptualized in the field of science and technology studies as sitting between what is called fluid technologies and in utero mobiles. And where fluid technologies uh, are open and flexible, they're made to adapt to changing conditions and able to change shape while maintaining their function. Um, and the famous example of that was the water pump described by uh, the lab and Roux, of which the parts could be easily replaced um, and, and the pump could still uh, work and maintain its, uh, its function. Immutable mobiles, as discussed by Latour, on the other hand, are made to hold their shape while traveling. Think, for example, about the list with test results going through uh, the hands of different doctors um, in a hospital. And then sticky technologies sit somewhat in between these two. So thinking through stickiness kind of helps SDS researchers to focus attention on what makes the technology of their concept flexible, um, but persist and also helps to address the frictions generated by the limited adaptability of, um, of sticky things. So in the context of our research project, thinking through stickiness helps us to shed light on the difficulties of transforming the concept of excellence. Um, we suggest that the baggage that sticks to excellence are in particular ideals around um, competition and meritocracy. Um, but the stickiness of excellence not only means that there are things that stick to it, excellence is also made to stick to other things as well. And in that sense, I was kind of um, picturing excellence a bit like uh, the ball that, uh, that uh, plays a role in the Katamari Damasi game, which is uh, a ball to which things stick and as it becomes bigger, it comes to absorb uh, more and larger things. So in that sense, excellence sticks, for example, to the mission statement of an organization as a guiding principle for all aspects of the work and excellence sticks like a self, almost like a self-adhesive label to a range of initiatives uh, in the context of research funding. Um, for example, a program to assure standards of excellence in peer review or national research evaluation exercises like uh, excellence in research for Australia or the UK research excellence framework. And stickiness also kind of hints at the attractiveness of excellence, uh, like who doesn't want excellence? Um, and this attractiveness is also sometimes strategically used by funding organizations. For example, when uh, so, sort of as someone was explaining to me selling a new funding program to the government. Um, but importantly, stickiness also comes with friction. And it has been argued that the concept of excellence has been at odds with academic values of creativity, openness and integrity. Um, and today, the focus on excellence has been become associated with a range of problems in the research ecosystem, such as homogeneity, Matthew effects, and hypercompetition, as uh, Stephen also already mentioned. So, research or funding organizations are very much aware of these issues and have been trying to adapt their understandings of excellence in attempts to mitigate such problems. And one of the things that is currently high on the agenda of many funding organizations are matters of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, yeah, so excellence has actually rather been associated with exclusionary practices that uh, favor those who fit a very specific image of the ideal scientist and work conforming dominant epistemic practices. Um, and we observed that the above mentioned issues of homogeneity, concentration of research resources and hypercompetition are also increasingly addressed in terms of an EDI discourse emphasizing the lack of opportunities for those researchers and modes of working that fall outside of the norm. Uh, and as one interviewee responded to a question about the limitations to the notion of excellence, was like, it's not exactly a Matthew effect thing, although that's the outcome of it, but it's, you know, the people who look like me issue. Um, and more recently, attempts have been made to bring excellence and diversity closer together. So the notion of inclusive excellence has gained track in North American research and higher education institutions. And from the university sector, it also made its way to research funding uh, organizations. For example, in the new strategic plan of the Michael Smith Foundation uh, for Health Research, it, it reads, diversity in research is important to cultivating talent and promoting inclusive excellence, which in turn drives discovery. Um, so the notion of inclusive excellence, to summarize, kind of aims to counter the idea that excellence and diversity do not go well together. But interestingly, I find that by doing so, diversity seems to become rather subsumed by excellence, as diversity here is made into a precondition for performances, for performance. So promoting EDI is not a goal in itself, 
like, for example, just to improve the well-being of researchers and create more uh, collegial research cultures. Instead, matters of EDI become articulated in a performance discourse where diversity comes with the promise of increased productivity and scoring higher in the rankings. So in the words of Sarah Ahmed, diversity kind of becomes a technology of excellence. Thus, although the concept of inclusive excellence does strategic work to open up the discussion around matters of EDI and research cultures, it does not so much seem to transform excellence. Um, and excellence somehow manages to hold its shape and, and rather provides the conditions of possibility for diversity as the language of diversity is exercised as the late language of merit, to quote Ahmed again. Um, so the politics of competition and meritocracy that, sticks to ex that stick to excellence are carried over and give shape to how members of EDI are getting a place in strategies uh, of research funding organizations. And again, this is not to say that EDI initiatives are not important or that they do not make a difference, because I, I think they do. Um, but it is to say that if we intend to transform the research ecosystem, we need to start more thoroughly questioning those sticky things that hold excellence together. Um, so thank you. That was uh, my contribution. Uh, so far, I'll post the link to the uh, working paper in the chat in a bit, and I will stop sharing my screen and hand over to our next presenter. Thank you very much, Lizette. Um, and always good to have feline participants as well. Um, so um, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. Thank you. We have got, um, before I hand over to our next speaker, and I think that's going to be you, Cameron, if that's OK. Um, uh, Lizette, uh, there is a question in the, uh, the Q&A about um, how measures can be taken not to tokenize EDI as a technology of excellence. What's your initial response to that? I'm sure we'll come back to issues of this sort, but it'll be interesting to hear from you, um, your initial thoughts on that. Uh, yeah, thanks, that, that's a, that, that is a great point. Um, yeah, do I have a, a direct answer about that? I don't know. It's, uh, I think, as I try to end my presentation with this, it's really, I think, about questioning those things that lie behind it, right? So I think it start, would start with um, questioning the, the things that hold excellence together, such as competition and, and meritocracy. Uh, and I think um, that is kind of key to, yeah, actually open up the research ecosystem and um, make it a bit of a more welcoming place for um, for everyone. So I would I would say let's start there um, instead of holding holding on too much to, to excellence uh, itself. But I'm sure we can uh, come back to this in the yes, I'm discussion sure, I'm sure we will. because I, I assume that uh, that our other presenters also have a lot to say about uh, about this. Yeah, sure. And I'm sure we'll come back to it as an issue. So let's carry on with the presentation, shall we? So every all of the panel members can make a contribution. And Cameron, I'd like to invite you to, to go next. Thanks very much. Great. Um, thanks, thanks for having me. I thought it would be interesting to pick up on two aspects um, of the, the report, but I'm going to note something to sort of frame, frame what I'm going to say first. This isn't a criticism of the organisers. Um, but I'm going to observe it's five o'clock in the morning here. Um, I'm in Western Australia, a couple of hours south of Perth. And one of the things I've noticed since I've come back to Perth is that despite the fact the pandemic has led all of us to be more sensitive to the fact that people are in different time zones, um, it's still the people, particularly in this time zone, who seem to either be getting up at five in the morning or being on meetings at 10 o'clock at night. And the interesting thing about that is not that I object violently to talking to people at, at odd times of the day, though it gets a bit tiring at times, but I'm actually sitting in the world's most populous time zone. A quarter of the world's population live in GMT plus eight. And yet uh, our meetings, our thoughts, the narrative we have around where people who do research and work in our community are, is still built around the presumption that the center of gravity is somewhere in the mid-Atlantic 
Um, so I want to sort of build on that idea of, of narratives um, and stories that we tell ourselves. Another thing that I want to do um, is acknowledge I'm speaking to you from uh, Noongar lands in Western Australia, unceded um, traditional lands uh, of the Noongar people and recognise their elders past, present and future um, and their continuing connection with the land. Again, it's a story in Australia and some other places now we tell ourselves about how we're recognising um, those contributions and that expropriation of resources. My university and the wealth that it relies on is largely built on the uh, theft in many ways of uh, resources that we dig up out of the ground and sell overseas. Um, and at the same time, that's a narrative and a story we tell ourselves about equity, diversity and inclusion, that we're improving our history in this space, our, our, our spaces in this space, um, though it's a very rhetorical storytelling kind of thing. Um, so I wanted to focus a little on this idea of, of two things. One, I'm particularly interested in the institutional ideas of excellence, um, the stories we tell about excellence. Um, and other things in the academy. Um, the work we're doing at the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative, in fact, if I shift over to my right, you can possibly see our tagline um, if I haven't reversed it. Um, but we're really focused on change through change in narratives. Um, so this idea of changing universities through changing the stories they tell about themselves, um, we think is really powerful um, because what we've found um, in our work on change is um, that the people in power at the top of organisations are not antagonistic to many of these ideas, which I think a lot of us advocates for change have assumed often, um, but they simply don't receive information in the form they need to be able to make different kinds of decisions because that information is simply not available. Again, for instance, in my organisation and in a number of other organisations we've looked at, information about equity, diversity and inclusion simply isn't there. Uh, people can't tell about whether we're retaining um, people from disadvantaged backgrounds because we don't record a lot of that information and certainly it's not um, recorded by, by the institutions that judge us and the institutions that fund us. The thing that is recorded, the thing that does seem to matter to those institutions that judge us and fund us um, are these conceptions of excellence. I, lo I love the idea of the sticky concept that wraps things up and, and gathers things to it along its way. Um, and to use that as a way of asking the question, well, how might we change that? How might we either make it less sticky um, or, or replace it? And the technological conception is an interesting one, right? So as soon as you start thinking in terms of uh, fluid technologies or modular technologies where bits of it can be swapped out and put in place. We have to address the question of whether we actually have to do wholesale reform and rip the whole system down and start again. Um, and when I think about excellence, and I guess I'm on the record as being pretty critical over, of it as a concept over the years, um, it seems to me that in many ways the idea of needing to replace it is a little bit is, feels like a bit of a misdirection or a bit of a, 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 a the, the wrong kind of approach, because really there are two ends to this. One is um, that it's a conception and a set of stories, a set of sticky concepts um, that is so corrupt and corrupting um, that if we do not get rid of it, um, we are going to actually destroy the academy and the, the things that it values, and we can talk more about that. But but there's an example I had in in this piece. Oops, which I've just sent to just the panelists. Sorry, excuse me. I'm gonna send that to everyone. Um, uh, so this chapter in this book, where I really made the argument that conceptions of research excellence, particularly in um, lower and middle income countries, was really neo-colonial. That we were actually recolonizing the capacities, interests, and directions. Um, of the research efforts in these countries. And that's, you know, that was damaging four to five years ago when I wrote this piece. Um, but obviously in the context of the issues around vaccine availability, um, patents, 
issues sitting around that um, has become a real issue. The piece that I mentioned in in that in that in that chapter is looking at um, the relationship between the amount of research being done. This was just a simple uh, topic search um, in Web of Science at the time. Um, and then I looked at the number of articles being produced out of South Africa compared to the mortality rates for particular health and other issues um, in South Africa. And what I observed was that there was a good correlation between um, the, the cause of death and the amount of research being done on, as counted by numbers of articles, um, but only for things that also concerned Western audiences and Northern audiences. So for things like HIV or um, uh, things around uh, blood pressure and heart disease, there was a good correlation. But for things around uh, respiratory tract um, infections and in particular car accidents, the amount of research um, didn't follow the kind of issue of the burden um, that was being faced. So I think there's a there's an argument that you know, replacing it. No, we need to completely destroy this, start again, build from the ground up. Um, and then at the other end, um, and this notion of excellence as an aspirational thing, I think is an, is an interesting one. It's almost seems kind of obvious, right? It's just something we need to grab a hold of ourselves. We just need to use the tools we have at our disposal to refine what it is we're looking for at an institutional level. Um, and so I'm thinking here of things like um, particularly the scope framework from the INORM's Research Evaluation Working Group, um, but also the strategic um, uh, research assessment process is being developed in the Netherlands, where you know, the first step is always defining what you care about. Um, and if we're going to take the sort of pragmatic end of the approach and try to reform what we're doing, and grabbing control of that process and actually really actively defining what it is we care about up front and why and what makes for excellent research in our views seems like to me the way forward. And so I think that's a point I'd like to discuss, um, both the balance between the individual, because we often talk about excellence and its impacts on issues like EDI and other things as a concern of the individual or for the individual. So I'd really like to think about the distinction between that and the institutional um, and cultural aspect. Um, and we talk a bunch about that in this book, which of course is open access, um, available from, from MIT Press, uh, where we talk about transforming universities. Um, and then think about the pragmatics of this. How do we embed more of the choices around what really matters and have conversations about really matters. Because I still go back to the thing I think I've been saying for about a decade now. Every time I see the word excellence, I see a person or an organization that's avoiding having a conversation about values. And we deploy these words, words like excellence, like peer review, the very things that we study as meta scientists, I guess. Um, across the academy often in ways to avoid conversations about the detail of what we're trying to do. So in a, in a sense, it's really just a back to basics. What do we care about and why? Um, and how do we get those things embedded more in the culture and narratives of what we're doing? Um, and I'd love to talk more about that in the conversation. Thank you very much indeed for that very thoughtful contribution. Much appreciated. Um, we do have, um, a question that's been put and I wonder if you could give us an initial view about that but once again this is an issue I suspect we will come back to so uh, the question is whose values should lead the discussion of a change governments the research ecosystem civil society what, what, what's your comment on that yeah so so this is a this is the core challenge in most of these discussions right you've got more people who want to be at the table than are at the table in these conversations. And there are more people who should be at the table who don't even know the table exists. Um, and so um, one of the things we say in the book, actually, um, it's probably the hardest bit for people to wrap their heads around is, um, so we take the view that knowledge making is about bringing communities together and core to that process is coordinating the interactions between communities and this coordination piece of bringing communities together and actively going out and seeking the communities that ought to be engaged um, 
is a core function of a knowledge institution in the 21st century. Um, that includes having the capacity and the expertise, not just to recognise that a particular group um, may be impacted or involved or should be consulted, or in fact, should be directly driving a particular piece of research, um, but it also involves the thing which we're still very bad at, which is genuinely building trust with those communities so they feel like their engagement is of value to them. Um, so the answer for me is everybody needs to be involved, but we still don't have the mechanisms and systems in place, except in some very narrow slices of the knowledge making ecosystem where we're good at engaging genuinely engaging, not just consulting and then ignoring, but genuinely engaging with the, the interested parties. Um, lots of great work being done over the last 20, 30 years with patient groups, increasing efforts being made in particular sort of disadvantaged groups, including in Australia, engagement with Indigenous groups, but a huge amount of trust um, that we need to uh, justify and over time earn. And that's a, that's a decades long project. Um, to build the systems that's capable of engaging all of the communities that should be involved in these conversations. Thank you very much uh, for that. So uh, let me now turn to you now, Zina, if that's okay, and invite you to make your contribution. And just a reminder to everybody in the audience, thanks very much for your questions coming in. Uh, after Zina's spoken, it, it doesn't look like our, our fourth panel member is going to uh, arrive, although I'm still hopeful, but I do hope she's okay. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we've got quite a few people in the room, and I recognise quite a few names and quite a lot of expertise associated with them on this topic, so it'd be really great to hear from you as well. Um, so, uh, but before I, I try and... Uh, solicit any further questions and control you into uh, contributing. Um, let's now turn to Zena. Zena, over to you. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Stephen. And I'm really glad to be here. And I'm coming to you from unceded ancestral couch and tribes territories, which is important to acknowledge the land we're on as Cameron did as well, especially when we are connecting virtually. And I'm thinking about this in particular because my family and I recently moved to these lands. So we have shown up as white settlers, on an, uh, as uninvited visitors, uninvited guests on these particular territories. So just rooting into that knowing and the accountabilities that come with it. And when I think about the theme of this panel and this notion of after excellence, a few questions came to mind for me. So my first question is, well, what is it we're after exactly? The second question is, well, why are we chasing after it? And the final question for me is, well, what comes after excellence? And in posing those questions, it's important to reference the fact that I've worked in the health research funding sector at national and provincial levels in Canada since 2008. And I've been an overachieving nerd since well before then, and I'm trained as a health researcher. I was someone who came up through academia, so spent many years thinking I was going to become a professor before my career pivoted into funding. And I feel acutely conscious of how excellence has gotten under my skin by virtue of being trained, working in, and being socialized into professional identities in contexts deeply invested in an imagined and fundamentally inequitable meritocracy. Excellence as a quality and a goal is pervasive in research funding and academia, as we've heard about from the other speakers, and as you can see in the really excellent literature review that's been cited here. Excellence feels like it's everywhere in these contexts, though it often goes undefined or is operationalized in such a way that perpetuates systemic inequities and entrenches research and academic cultures that hinder the flourishing of people and ideas. As a white person living on stolen Indigenous land, I am acutely aware of the ways in which my own perceived and socially constructed academic and professional excellence, in quotation marks, is entangled with systemic inequities, white supremacy, and colonization. Excellence as a perceived quality is not equity, equitably or fairly distributed, and I can certainly reflect on the many ways just at a personal level I've profited from this. 
I understand from experience and from witnessing the inner workings of academia and research funding agencies, how being deemed excellent often leads to an accumulation of privilege on top of privilege. And I see part of my work and my own accountabilities in all of this as challenging and uprooting the ways in which excellence attempts to work on me, as well as challenging and uprooting the harmful ways excellence works in the systems I'm part of shaping as someone who works in the research funding sector. And I know we've talked about excellence as sticky. I know it's also been described as a boundary object. I sometimes find it helpful also to think of excellence as a container when considering this question of what we're after when it comes to excellence. A container can hold a lot of things. Someone made it out of something. So I feel curious and often skeptical about what's inside this container we call excellence. Who made this container? Where did it come from? And what work is this container intended to do for us, consciously or otherwise? What are the unintended consequences of using this? And that brings me to my next question of why we're chasing after excellence. Just why are we after it anyway? Who does excellence benefit? What does this notion of excellence enable or constrain? This is another place where I found the research team's literature review helpful in articulating a set of historical and contextual conditions that shaped the evolution of what has become what I, I often perceive to be a taken for granted notion of excellence. It might shift according to context, but I think it often plays out in similar ways. Here I'm thinking about things like the rise of neoliberalism, related attempts and, and certainly successes in the corporatization of academia and universities, this notion of running a more efficient research enterprise and attendant tendencies towards quantification, as well as, again, something that came up in the literature review that was both surprising and ultimately extremely obvious to me, which was the earlier connections to eugenics in some of these early notions of excellence. So we can, we really, I think, need to understand the, the, the tangled and toxic roots of these concepts. So with this, I finally come to this question of what comes after excellence, you know, thinking about this context, thinking about this history. Out of curiosity, I recently looked up the etymology of the word after. It was there that I learned the word afterwit, which is a word from the 1500s that has fallen out of use, which is why I had never heard of it before. But it means wisdom that comes too late. So in the spirit of after excellence and after wit, I am cautious of attempts to replace excellence with a concept purported to be more equitable or inclusive. As they say in the healthcare quality field, the system isn't broken, it's working as designed. And although I certainly have strategically marshaled concepts of inclusive excellence, I think it's also really imperative that we not only look at this container we call excellence, we also need to interrogate the conditions under which it was created and is recreated and what this might mean for the success of efforts to simply create a replacement container without fundamentally altering the means of production. To mix my metaphors, excellence isn't the disease, it's a symptom of larger problems. So when contemplating what might come after excellence, we must consider the preconditions that led to its creation and what we see existing in the systems that exist today. Cameron, I really appreciate what you spoke to around the need to think about creating different stories. And then I think this question of destroying excellence and building from the ground up is also an important site of inquiry when we think about, again, the institutions in which we are existing and of which we are a part. So these are some of my questions, and I'm really interested to hear your questions and reflections. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, for all that contribution as well. So we've heard from all of our panelists and thank you very much for your uh, contributions. And there are a number of issues that I'd like us to pick up. And also I'd very much welcome contributions from our audience as well. Um, you are able, if you put your hand up to contribute and we can switch your mic uh, and camera on, or we, you can once we, once we allow that to happen. So we'd very much welcome uh, that as well. It'd be great to hear from you. While people are, um, are doing that, please add stuff to the chat as well and also to the Q&A and we'll keep an eye on all of those. While people are, are thinking about that, I'd like to pick up on this idea of universality or situatedness uh, of excellence. Um, 
uh, behind the idea of excellence is often an idea of its universality. Um, the idea of world class, which has been mentioned in the in the chat, uh, for example. But even notions like uh, rigor and so on often assume a sort of normative understanding of what constitutes rigor. And I'm just interested in, in whether any of you panel members, first of all, have ideas about the extent to which um, excellence can be considered a universal thing, even if we have to redesign it. So Cameron, you made some comments, for example, about the subject matter of scientific investigation. Is, is, if you like, is that the nature of its situatedness? Or is there something more about the very kind of knowledge types that are being created, which makes it more situated? So what's, what are your perspectives on that? Cameron, can I ask you to address that first, as you mentioned that, but very interested to hear from other people as well. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take a pop at it at two, at two levels. Um, one is, um, and again, there's more on this in the book, so I'm not going to regurgitate um, the book, particularly at five o'clock in the morning, because social theories of knowledge at five o'clock in the morning and not my strong point. Um, but one of the things, the argument we make is built on this idea that knowledge happens when communities, groups come together. So the situatedness is everything. It's the experience of the group and the people and the processes and the institutional systems, including this concept of, for instance, the scientific method, again, scare quotes required, um, that we work within and that are institutional forms that have served us well um, to some extent in the past and caused other problems as well. Um, but I'm certainly will sit on the side of saying that the Western knowledge production system has some things that are good about it and has done done a good job of creating certain kinds of knowledge and that we can enhance some of the good aspects of it um, by bringing in um, more consensus, more situatedness, more contextualization and more of the broadening of experiences. Um, so that's so I think you, that that's one of those unhelpful answers where you say, well, the context the context is everything. Um, but it's also not a very helpful thing to say in the abstract, because <laughs> then what do you do with it? And so I have a very concrete um, example of how I've dealt with this right at the moment. I have been writing a document um, that is intended to become um, a set of principles around research evaluation that will be used for research evaluation. Um, and in that document, I started with two principles, um, which I adopted from other you know, work on these things that many of the people in the room have done. Um, and those were suitability. So anything you use to do evaluation needs to be a suitable approach for the thing you're evaluating. But in the context we're working, we need comparability. Um, we need to be able to use this information to make choices about resource allocation where, you know, there are, the dollars are a zero sum game or um, where is the attention going, who gets the support. And I think what was, what I thought was useful in setting up this document was I set those things up deliberately as attention. So not saying, oh, you should have this and that, but you need both and they are intention. So your choice to use citations as a measure of something excludes is useful because you get numbers and numbers can be compared across different places if you're careful about how you do it um, but you're also excluding whole classes of research and knowledge making activity that generate things that do not get cited and do not, do not so yeah the thinking of that as a tension as a tension that we're working with and as something that could be productive but this is the point by negotiating how we might choose to measure ourselves and and again to, to Zena's point who are we doing this for and how are their interests served um, that we start to to address those questions so I guess that's that's one version that's sort of very abstract and theoretical um, and notionally inclusive but things that are really inclusive tend to be exclusionary in practice because no one can actually grapple with them down to the concrete where we're trying to figure out how to actually make this work on the ground in practice. Uh, we'll, we'll come to that because we've got an interesting question on, if you like, moving to 
real world applications, which I'd like us to address in just a moment. We were hoping to hear from Laura Ravelli um, from the Latin American Council of Social Sciences, who would, uh, I've, I've no doubt have given us a, 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 another perspective on this whole question, because a, lot, a great deal of work has been done, I know, in a number of Latin American contexts in this whole, in this whole field. So uh, if there are any um, uh, people in the audience who are able to give different perspectives um, from different sort of global contexts, I'd be really interested to hear from you. Please do raise your hand if you're able to make a, a contribution and, um, and take part in the discussion. Um, Zina or Lisette, either of you want to address this question of the extent to which excellence can be a universal? I'm suddenly having flashbacks to first year philosophy class, which was in 1997. So that's not particularly helpful to me in this moment. Um, I'm not going to tell you about my essay on Plato's cave, but I, that's not, not at all relevant here. I, I, I know enough to, to about 1997 to tell you that. Um, I mean, you know, the thing I can think about in terms of the universality versus situatedness piece is, I mean, certainly I think that that I don't think there's any universal notion of uh, of excellence. I mean, that that's just not a real thing, right? Excellence is made up. It's a thing we made up. It's a thing we we make up and, and perpetuate in different kinds of contexts. Um, I, I mean, I think that the place where the universal universality versus situated kind of gets interesting and and challenging in in terms of what does it mean in practice, you know? And Cameron, I think you gestured to this in, in what you were just talking about in terms of the work you're doing is thinking about the work that we do in a research funding agency context. So I've worked in the health research funding sector specifically currently at the Michael Smith Foundation, which is a provincial health research funding agency in British Columbia, Canada. You know, we are actively thinking about what are the ways in which we might disrupt some of our own practices and assumptions in service of a more equitable, but I would say also impactful if we want to think about the kinds of impacts we're actually seeking to have um, forms of health research and, and, and doing things like shifting, for example, the way in which we design assessment criteria for applications, shifting the design of some of our funding programs in terms of who actually has the capacity to be able to apply for them, looking at how we actually interact with our chairs and scientific officers and our peer review panels more broadly to enable them to hopefully enact this notion of, of excellence or whatever proxy we're using in ways that may be more equitable, more aligned with strategic goals. We have, for example, around funding people from smaller universities, universities in more rural or northern areas, you know, folks who are Black, Indigenous, people of color, or other groups that are systemically underrepresented by virtue of the oppressive context in which they're working. And the thing I would say there is we are engaging in these kind of ongoing practical experiments to varying degrees of success. Something that I think is a constraint that I am often challenged by is that we are up against the vastness of academic and research culture and, and that that operates in incredibly potent and invisible ways within the context of the peer review system. So I think that that, that is an interesting, again, another tension or challenge that we need to grapple with here is that, you know, as a funder, it's not just us in the room. We, we rely on the peer review system, but that in and of in and of itself is so entangled with research culture, which of course is also so entangled with, with excellence and all the stuff attached to that. So I wanted to offer those reflections in part because I did see a question in the Q&A as well around kind of how do we get academics to apply this to themselves in a more kind of practical way. And, and just to say that I am, I am inside that struggle, um, fortunately with excellent colleagues at the Michael Smith Foundation. So we don't have the answers, but we have experiments and we're always keen to learn. Thank you. Um, Lizette, have you got any comments on that? Um, well, I, I think uh, to, the, to the initial question, I think Sina made a very important uh, point that indeed, like excellence cannot be universal. It, it's, it's made up somewhere. And I think precisely all these uses of excellence where it's uh, presented as a universal concept um, actually precisely obscures that, you know, that excellence has a history, that it comes from somewhere, that it comes from a very specific place and that it carries some very specific ideas about what research should look like and what research should look like. Um, so that's one thing. And uh, another thing I can add to this is that uh, in, in the research project that we're doing, uh, looking at um, all these different ways in which notes of excellence are used uh, in the context of research funding organizations, that there, there, there's already such a wide range of, of, of 
uses. So it, uh, yeah, like uh, looking very closely at that, it, it, it seems to not make much sense to think of excellence as something universal because even within one organization, it can do so many different things and it, it comes to mean so many different things. Um, so um, yeah, that's what I wanted to add. Yeah, I mean that 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 that's really uh, important, I think. And 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 thank you very much for the questions that are coming in. Please do keep them coming in and and the chat as well. Um, Gabrielle has made a really interesting comment in the chat, for example, about um, more and more countries uh, joining the excellence uh, uh, regime as or the excellence agenda um, at the same time as it being questioned. In other countries, which I think is an irony. Anybody who can talk to that, we're really interested to hear hear from you to get your impressions on on that. Well, while we're waiting, I'd be I'd be very interested to hear um, more about how, if you like, the um, the abstract or apparently abstract criticisms of excellence can be um, turned into on the ground action. And, and particularly in relation to the question that's uh, come up a couple of times, um, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, uh, Zina, you, you commented on very briefly on the um, in, idea of inclusive excellence, which has been around for a little while as an attempt to um, moderate some of the negative consequences of uh, as they're seen of the excellence agenda. Do you think that has any future as, a, as an agenda or do you think it's trying to simply only moderate and, and that's not enough? What do you feel about the, the issue of, of EDI and excellence? I mean, I think that's, I, I guess I would give it a, a yes and, and I think in, in saying that, which I will expand on, I know that in the literature review, uh, and again, I, I really am, I'm hyping the literature view because I think it is actually a really fascinating and useful document for folks who haven't had a chance to read it. But it does give, I think, a bit more of a history of where that concept originated. Um, I would say I'm seeing it. And also my three-year-old is thumping around outside the door. So if you can hear that, um, I don't have a cat, but I have a small joyful child who is being attended to by other adults right now, uh, just to give you the live Zoom reality of my excellent life. Um, so just to say, I mean, I would say the inclusive excellence concept, I think, has a longer history that I am less well versed in, uh, as I understand, comes out of, I think, the US. Uh, I've seen it used more widely in Canada in the last several years during a time when we have seen, I think, for a number of reasons, including human rights challenges by uh, academics who were systemically underrepresented in major government funding schemes. We have seen more attention to equity, diversity, and inclusion by federal funding agencies and by universities. Um, certainly, that has been a big shift um, in the many years I've been working in this sector in Canada. That's complex, right, in the sense that I think it is leading to some material changes in the allocation of resources, for example, um, broader discourses of equity, diversity, and inclusion. But as I've seen people way smarter and more skilled than me, uh, you know, who generally, again, are Black, Indigenous, and folks of color um, who have been deeply embedded in, in the work around equity, diversity, and inclusion and critiquing equity, diversity, and inclusion for, for generations. I think it's really about, you know, how do we even question the notion of where equity, diversity, and inclusion came from versus, for example, a more liberation-oriented approach, you know, approaches that are more transformative and looking at actually questioning and shifting the institutions we're inside. So, I mean, I try to bear those complexities in mind when also thinking about what are the ways in which we can move strategically through the work of actually affecting systemic change. Um, and that's something I don't have easy answers to in terms of doing my best to work in a way that feels aligned with my values and personal politics, trying to work strategically in large and complex bureaucracies that often don't want to move. And so when I find those windows of opportunity or those leverage points in the system, I am interested in utilizing those, like, for example, notions of inclusive excellence. But I try to do it with a lot of um, questions around it and never assuming my own rightness or goodness in all of this. Because I think, again, I also try to be attuned to the specific violence and harm I can do as a white cisgender woman um, in this work of equity, diversity, and inclusion, or trying to bring forth a more inclusive notion of excellence. I mean, and, and I think it's important to situate ourselves in this work, as well as being institutionally and conceptually and theoretically situated in all of it. So 
I mean, again, I, I'm interested in these, these strategic questions, right? How do we do the work of change in ways that are actually sustainable and ultimately connected to, to what I see as a larger political as well as intellectual and academic project? Hmm. Lisette, I want to come to you in, in just a moment to ask you about um, how your research has uh, given insight into um, how different funding organisations are, are looking at this question of EDI. Uh, but just to give you notice, Cameron, I want to move on to you uh, after that, maybe to address this question, but also to address the question that's been put in the Q&A about the relationship between well, that gives rise to the issue of the relationship between universities as institutions and their other communities and the extent to which universities have tried before, historically that is, to, if you like, retain autonomy as, a, as seen as a strength, whereas you seem to be seeing it as a weakness. And I'd be really interested to, to get your view on that in relation to excellence. But let's go, that's just to give you notice, I'm gonna ask you about that. But um, Lizette, um, how has your research um, given us insight into this question of EDI? How are, how are different funding organizations in the case studies you've been looking at dealing with it? Um, well, yeah, one, one note I want, I want to make uh, about this, and that is that of course, and it was already slightly mentioned that this idea of, of EDI and, and term equity, diversity and inclusion or, or uh, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, it's different acronyms. It's also not used everywhere. <laughs> so again, it's also this specific way used very much in indeed like a North American context. You can find it in, in the UK as well. But if you look at um, already other countries in, in Europe that uh, where organizations are included, it, it doesn't appear um, everywhere. Um, but overall, I think many funders are currently concerned with being more inclusive in their uh, own practices and are quite reflexive about this, starting conversations. Um, but I think it's what is what I find quite interesting is that there's quite some differences in the way in which funders position themselves in the research landscape regarding um excellence transforming excellence transforming the research ecosystem and also uh, around matters of um edi like some funders position themselves more like well we um we we facilitate a process of of decision making we facilitate a process of peer review and and how decisions are made it's very much left to like the scientists or the, or the peer reviewers and we're not going to intervene so much and while under funders take a more firm position and are actually trying to actively intervene by, for example, training um, uh, reviewers, uh, provide bias training or um, well, work in all sorts of other ways or, or yeah. Um, so I think that that's quite interesting to see. So sort of like how different funders um, sort of position themselves in the landscape and, and, and think differently about what is the responsibility of a funder in, in this uh, context. So. Yeah, that's 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 what I'm observing um, right now, and yeah, it's 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 yeah. That, so there's a, a range of positions that are being taken, and that's not necessarily that it's only the really independent funders who are being more interventionist. It's, so sometimes it's also government funders. So it, it doesn't seem to have a very strong pattern. What I do seem to see is that funders that have a very wide portfolio, so that, that cover um, many different uh, disciplines. Uh, yeah, it seems there to be a little bit more uh, difficult to, to make big interventions, kind of like the more specific uh, the work and, or, the, or the, the focus of a funder is and the more sort of the smaller kind of the, the field that it seems to more um, concrete that uh, interventions are, are possible, which kind of makes sense because, of course, if you indeed, as was mentioned already before, um, a funder doesn't operate in isolation, right? So it's part of this larger system, and and all and scientific disciplines also work in different ways. Um, so I think there's a there's an interesting complexity uh, going on there. And somebody's commented in the Q and A about the possibility of linking funding specifically to EDI as well, which I think is a, 
is happening to a, a certain certain degree, but not um, it's not prevalent in, in amongst many funders that I'm aware of. Cameron, over to you. First of all, do you have any comments about the EDI issue? But also, I'm very interested in this issue of the extent to which um, institutions um, should regard autonomy of decision making within the academy as, a, as something to be protected, or whether it's something actually that is a weakness. Can't hear you. Let me unmute myself first. Um, <laughs> um, let me start with the abstraction, then I'll tell you a story. Um, the uh, picking up particularly on what what Zeta was saying, I guess my work has always been the way I have always worked has been through systems and institutions that exist, um, and through trying to make change, because I've always believed that if you want to make sustained change. Um, ripping everything down um, tends to just recreate the same problems. Um, and when I was in high school, we had a had a poem from a poet who probably no one outside of Australia has ever heard of called Bruce Dorr, um, which was actually about um, military coups in South America. But the poem the poem was called "Only the Beards Are Different," and that stuck with me ever since. The revolutions tend to lead to the same power structures, the same people ending up in power. Um, and at the same time, I think to again to see this point, um, the institutions I'm talking about, they are explicitly patriarchal colonial institutions. That was their purpose. That was what they were designed to do. This is the system working as designed. Again, from where I'm sitting, um, the idea that our universities in Australia uh, had graduate, postgraduate teaching is a relatively late thing. Um, and we have still the Rhodes Scholarship still exists as a thing where the best and brightest go back to Oxford because that's where you get proper education and training. Um, so change is, is dangerous um, if you're trying to do it within those institutions. Um, and so actually in the, the chapter um, in the African Minds book, I did explore this issue of autonomy um, autonomy versus responsibility versus engagement with society and government. Um, and I made the argument that this was a real tension that needed to be observed. Autonomy, autonomy and academic freedom, that's not a word I you would normally choose to use, I think are an important part of knowledge making in a small l liberal society. Um, the freedom to explore, the freedom to engage, the freedom to criticise and think deeply about things is important, and the autonomy of knowledge making institutions from government interference is a is an important part of that, and something that is worth protecting um, and guarding where we have it. Um, at the same time, gaining that autonomy is a question of building stakeholder trust and having governments engaged in. Um, believing that that autonomy is something that's of value um, and something they want to protect. Um, and again, I well, I could rant for a long time about the government in this country, but in the UK and in the US, certainly government interference in, in universities is looking in many ways to be a similar level to you know, places we would normally regard as not um, certain not liberal democracies. Um, so it's complicated, <laughs> but let me let me give you the story. Um, so a couple of years ago, um, we ran a workshop in Mauritius. We brought a, a bunch of people. We had that workshop in Mauritius because it would be easy for people to come, easy earth for people to come from Africa um, for visa reasons. You know, again, thinking about the ways in which people do get excluded from things. And we had um, someone come and the, both myself and Stephen Curry were in this meeting and we were talking about research evaluation. So you can imagine Stephen Curry and I went in sort of rankings are bad, university rankings are terrible. Obviously these people will agree with us that rankings are terrible and horrible things that universities shouldn't engage with. Um, and we had a very eloquent um, black senior academic from Ghana saying, Actually, um, no, rankings are really important because they provide an external point of leverage for us to tackle issues of corruption and nepotism 
in the system. They give us a means of pointing to an outside space, it's outside the power structures we operate in. And I'm put, slightly putting words in their mouth now, but essentially those rankings, those external and universal conceptions of excellence were actually giving them autonomy, um, which is a kind of, was certainly a, a wake up call um, from my perspective. So I think the, the problem is we have to build institutions and we actually have to build new institutions and better institutions that manage the tension between autonomy, um, trust, um, but also responsibility. I think autonomy comes with responsibility um, and you can lose your autonomy if you don't take responsibility for those engagement and you know, needs to serve society. Um, and again, I appreciate that's pretty waffly um, in terms of what that means in terms of direct action, um, but it's, it's where I've landed. It's just hard work and we've got to get on and do it. Thank you for that. Now, moving on from that, Sophia in the Q&A asks an excellent, excellent question that I'm, I'm not sure I can do justice to. So Sophia, if you are able to switch your mic on or do raise your hand and I can um, activate your mic, we'd be really interested to hear from you. But let me try to um, well, let me draw your attention to it and, and, and try to um, in, uh, gloss it and maybe invite you to comment, those of you that would like to do so. Because it does both pick up on the EDI issue that we've mentioned in, in very direct ways, but, but also talks about the possibility of coordinated action in this area as a means of addressing those kinds of problems. And I think that that's quite a, an interesting thing to ask you about, the extent to which collaboration across regions and across uh, funding agencies is a strategy that's realistic here in order to um, address some of the problems we've been talking about. Who'd like to address that? Zina, would you have any comments on that? around the possibility of coordinated action. I was actually just going back and rereading the comment because it is so rich. I mean, yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean, and, and the reason I say that is I think I, I wanna name the fact that I have been trained in and worked in and lived in Canada my entire life, right? And so so again, Cameron, even thinking about some of the comments you offer just, just as introducing your piece or, or your, your remarks around kind of where you are globally situated. And I think these very, lopsided and, and colonial and, and white supremacist kind of dynamics of power in terms of, again, where, where, where it is believed that excellence originates. And certainly, I mean, if you look at the history of where these notions of excellence originate, I mean, there are these kinds of interconnections. So, so yes, do I believe in the power of working collaboratively to, to change and disrupt systems? Yes. Do I think that's necessary? Absolutely. Do I think it's possible and feasible? Sometimes. Um, so yeah, that, that is something I do, I do feel curious about because I would say, you know, even just through the work I've done professionally, we do a little bit of collaborating with Europe, you know, it often tends to be, um, in, in EU countries and with the UK, sometimes with Australia, with the US, but that's about where it ends and it's very white, right? And, and, and I just, I'm trying to be very explicit about that because I think it's important to name these kinds of dynamics. And so to me, that's insufficient collaboration. And, and even thinking about in the Canadian context, there's been enormous and really important work that has been done for, for decades and generations around Indigenous health research in Canada and really ensuring that our health research funding enterprises is actually equipped to assess Indigenous health research in ways that are culturally safe, that really respect the methodologies and priorities and knowledge traditions of Indigenous people and communities in Canada, well, the lands colonially known as Canada. Because um, again, the funding the funding enterprises is, is ill-equipped to do that and is having to do a lot of retrofitting, again, because of sustained activism and leadership by Indigenous folks working in those contexts, right? This is not out of the goodwill of the institution. So, I'm, I'm thinking of that example, I think specifically even about sort of what are those intranational uh, kind of opportunities and challenges and, and conditions. And then what does that kind of raise in terms of the possibilities around collaboration across borders 
And I mean, of course, the larger question of why do we have borders in the first place, right? And thinking about that as a racialized capital, capitalist and kind of colonial, you know, violent entity in and of itself, thinking about the work of people like Harsha Walia and others. So, you know, there's layers upon layers of this. And, and I'm conscious, I think, of the people in the Zoom room that are saying, okay, but what does this mean for me in my everyday life? And, and I think these are ongoing challenges for all of us touching into this work in some kinds of ways. And Definitely curious to hear what others think and, and what others are doing and experimenting with in their own context. I mean, I, I certainly do not have the answers. Thank you very much uh, for that. Now, Sophia, you very kindly um, raised your hand. So let me switch the button that allows you to talk and you should be able to join us. So just introduce yourself, please, and, uh, and make some comments about the, that arise from your question. Over um, to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Hi, I am a researcher, a postgrad at the University of Sao Paulo. Um, and I'm really just starting to work in, in questions of meta science and, um, and like scientometric research. Um, so you guys actually know a lot more than me, but something that I've really thought about a lot working in Latin America and, and with USP and with UNAM and Cielo, Redalic, Latin Dex, um, is that there are a lot of efforts in Latin America to define excellence, especially through through open access and through very transparent um, like standards for research that sometimes supersede the ones that exist globally. Like I said in my comment, and oftentimes will go ignored. I mean, even in the histories of open access, you might see a mention of of the CLO library, but not much more than that, even though like 70% of research in Latin America is open access. Um, and Brazil is one of the top producers of, of medical research and research in general in the world. Um, so I just wonder, you know, if, if funders or organizations that you guys work with, if there are more sort of direct um, kind of interventions that have to be made for for institutions in the global north to actually recognize the, the quote unquote research excellence in the global south, especially to the panelists who work like in, in South Africa and stuff where I'm and in Africa, where I know this is the same issue there. Um, it's just something I think about when we talk about EDI, it, you know, it doesn't always translate to, to the reality and, and to the kind of ugliness that exists sometimes, the prejudice, the deliberate disregard. For, for academics in the global south. Um, and of course, I, you know, I would say there's there's so much interest in the global, in, in Latin America, for example, to collaborate with researchers um, in the US or in Europe and other places, but there is, always seems to be very little interest on their part to come down to Brazil or to Mexico to, to work, to, to collaborate in the same way. Um, and I wonder why, and I, I wonder if there are, you know, like I said, sort of direct interventions through through funding or other for through universities that could really promote those collaborations and and hopefully kind of show people that maybe they're what they thought of was Latin America was Africa is not actually the case. Um, so that that's my comment, and and thank you guys so much for your for your discussions and um, and for your critics criticisms. Um, they're, they're really, they're great. Thank you very much for your contribution uh, as well. Uh, so uh, leading on from that, we've got a little over 10 minutes and I'd like to invite all of our panelists now to uh, continue in the spirit of direct interventions, right? And, 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 and to say where we go from here um, to maybe have one or two bullets that we'd like to finish on that are action focused um, would be really good and i'm padding here so you can all think hard before i pick a one of you <laughs> lisette why don't you go first well i was hoping i'd have a little bit more time um but i think i well one of my bullets uh could be relatively specific and it, it, it actually follows on, on a comment in the in the q a that wasn't addressed yet and it was this one. Um, somebody asked about whether the race equality charter is connected funding, but the, with the key question, so are funders giving preference 
to some protective characteristics of EDI rather than others. And I think this is uh, this is an interesting one. So this is very specifically about the EDI theme again. Um, I think generally there seems to be a lot of interest in gender. Gender seems to be considered quite the easy one, right? So um, we make a policy specific for female scientists and, and we're good. Um, and yeah, generally that tends to be a little bit uh, too simplistic. Uh, gender is also not that 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 simple um, because these policy often translate also in a very binary idea of gender with males with females. Um, yeah, and 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 also the, the so that and that again is also a question about uh, data gathering actually. So we come back to this point that Cameron also made. Like often we don't know, right? So. What they so I think that's a very key point related to the EDI to very critically think about what kind of data is being gathered and um, because sometimes data is gathered without really thinking so what are the, what questions are we actually asking when we are gathering this specific data sometimes the questions only come after so then this, the, the data that has been gathered already shapes the kind of questions that then can be asked so I think we should. Sort of switch that around really think of what are the critical questions to ask here and then what do, what kind of information do we need and maybe the methods that we have for that right now um cannot answer the questions that that should be addressed um so i think that's one uh one one key point i want to uh, want to make and it's maybe not still not that practical but i hope a little bit more practical <laughs> Well, the, the comment about comment. data and availability of data is very practical, even if it's a difficult one to solve, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, thank you for that. Cameron, over to you next. Uh, let, me, let me start with a thing that won't, that won't sound as practical, but it's actually, I think, the thing that has, again, uh, I know I keep coming back to this, but tell the story about how what you're doing matters to you or matters to other people and do that in every place you can. So that can take the point from writing a paragraph at the top of your CV or thinking about how you're writing an application letter or, a, or an abstract um, through to, you know, thinking creatively about the way you present the data um, in your CV if you have those options. And if you don't have those options, maybe complain about it. Um, um, but telling stories, it's stories in the end, not data, that drive the change um, and capture the imagination of the people with the power to make change. Um, and of course, then to turn that on its head, of course, most of us or many of us, particularly those of us with jobs in universities or in some of these institutions are the people in power. We should recognise the power we have. And so we should listen to other people's stories um, and see where we can learn from. Um, so to pick up from Sophia's point, you know, if you want to learn about how to do research with impact, go and talk to an African researcher, because they're much better at it than anyone in the Anglophone Northern Atlantic world. They are really good and it's really embedded and really just part of the culture in a way that um, you don't see in Northern Europe and, and North America. Um, if you want to learn about how to make open access work at large scale, go to Latin America. <laughs> Um, talk to the folks at, at Cielo and Redlick um, and, and learn, you know, actually learn from those successes and they're huge, massive successes. Um, and so then amplify those stories um, and, and then think about if you're in that position of power, what data is available to you? How can you bring the evidence to bear about how things are not working or how things might change. Um, so for instance, an interesting thing um, in terms of in the UK, um, uh, racial versus gender diversity in UK institutions, if you look at the correlation between the number of um, black people um, as recorded in the HESA data um, in um, UK universities, um, there's actually a positive correlation with the size of the institution, which correlates reasonably well with the prestige of the institution, there is a negative correlation with the proportion of women. Um, and so there's something, you know, we talk about gender as being something that's being tackled effectively in the UK. I'm not sure it is. Um, so, you know, also look at the data, look critically at the information that's there and ask questions about, about these narratives and whether they hold up um, 
when you start to test them. Um, and yeah, and I would say, maybe betraying my, my origin in the sciences, you know, advocate for more transparency um, and more of appropriate transparency to make some of these things available um, and self-reporting on how well we're doing and making progress on these things. So stories, um, you know, my bullet point would be tell stories, listen to stories, and then look for the evidence and test those stories against the evidence you can find or not find. Mm. Okay, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, Zena, finally over to you. Sure. I mean, I would say the first piece of advice I have, it comes, to, comes from a therapist I had many years ago, which was specifically around, I remember her talking to me about kind of a, a behavior I was hoping to change in my life. And, and she said, well, you know, sometimes, it's good to start by just noticing. You're noticing that this is happening. Maybe you're not ready to shift it. So with credit to Lorraine, my beloved therapist of many years ago, I will say, I think one of the things we can do, and this is something we can each do in the context that we're in, and that some of us may already be attuned to, but I think probably many of us are not and have to actually foster this practice, is practice noticing how and where excellence, in quotation marks, shows up in the context you work in. Get curious about this, because again, I think part of the challenge of this is that excellence does have that tendency to fade into the background. It becomes part of the air we're breathing, the water we're swimming in. And to me, that, that opportunity to notice, right, to actually start to discern a pattern, to unpack this taken for granted construct, you know, can again be a place of actually beginning to then understand where can one productively take action to begin shifting those dynamics? So that, that is the first one, practice noticing excellence, get curious about it. Um, and then the other piece I would say is think about how and where you might have the opportunities to productively disrupt these notions, you know, especially when they are showing up in, in harmful ways in the context in which you have influence and be willing to experiment. And again, I think we all have the capacity to do this in different contexts and at different scales. One example I can think of is the people I know, you know, basically everyone I'm thinking of is a queer person, a disabled person, you know, who is an academic working in a context of universities during the pandemic who have chosen to engage in queer abolitionist feminist pedagogies that are actually creating far greater humanity, I would say, in the, in the institutions of the university. So this notion of actually, again, rather than perpetuating what can be an incredibly harmful notion of excellence and how you might expect a student to show up um, around meeting deadlines or performing a certain kind of performance in a context of a global pandemic, they are taking different kinds of approaches in terms of engaging with different forms of grading or no grading at all, no attendance policies, this incredible, flexible, very thoughtful pedagogy. That to me is one example of what that can look like at the level of an individual instructor, which I know is work, which I know can be disciplined by the university, but I'm seeing people in my life experiment with this in incredibly generative and very interesting ways. Um, and again, I think that there are similar call to actions, obviously for those of us in a funding context and, and to not get stuck in fear of getting it wrong. And that doesn't mean we have unfettered permission to do whatever we want and, and cause further harm. But I do think we need to get out of that, that, that stuck place of perfectionism and having to get everything right and be willing to try. Uh, and that I think is, is another, another place that, that I think we can all do something. And that, that is how we shift a system. Thank you very much indeed for that. And I, I really like that note of uh, productively disrupt. Um, and that's a great note to uh, finish on. So thank you very much for that. Thank you to all of our panel members. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you for your questions, uh, for those of you uh, who, who contributed. And I hope it's been of interest uh, to you. We need to carry on this conversation, I think. Um, I think you can, um, you can see, or at least I hope you can see, how the, the discussion has been shaped by your comments. Um, so thank you very much for those. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed this session and indeed the rest of the conference. And just to finish off by saying, Cameron, you win the prize for the only member of per, uh, the only member of this Zoom call who hasn't had a household member trying to disrupt this Zoom call. So uh, thank you very much for that, and everybody else. Thank you, and uh, yeah, uh, have a good rest of the conference. And uh, thank you very much to everybody who's joined us. Thanks.
Hi, this is Leslie from uh, the Centre for Open Science. Thank you so much to all of our panellists for what has been a really thought provoking um, session. So, so thank you very much. And to everyone attending, um, I've just popped in the chat a reminder of our Slack and Remo um, spaces. So please do feel free to hop over to those spaces and continue the conversation. And uh, the next session will begin in half an hour. So thank you very much to everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.